It's amazing how two voices and a guitar can be so rich. Wonderful. So this is our second uh, week of Advent messages. We are looking at several I am statements that Jesus made about himself in the Gospel of John. And today's I am message, uh, we find Jesus declaring, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven, found in John chapter 6. And this is actually, it's a perfect Christmas season message because several times in this chapter, Jesus declares that he came down from heaven to earth. But in this case, you know, the incarnation. In this case, the emphasis is not in the form of a newborn baby. It's in the form of life-giving bread. Do you all have your piece of bread? Okay, you cannot eat it. But here's what you can do with it. You can smell it real quick, okay? Just smell it. Isn't that awesome? Is there anything better than fresh baked bread? Now, this isn't quite fresh, but it's, mm, it still smells yummy. Um, I, I, just this past week, I said to someone who works at Bath and Body that they should create a fresh baked bread scented candle. Come on, who's an entrepreneur here? I mean, you, this is like going to go viral if you do this. I'm sure of it. So, so bread has been a, a staple food in man's diet since the earliest of times. And uh, millstones for grinding grain have been found in pits where human settlements flourished, dating back over 8,000 years ago. And here is a rendering of a, a drawing that was found on the wall in a cave. And it kind of shows the whole process from the harvest to the grinding of the grain. This was found way back, it dates all the way back to uh, 2600 BC. And an interesting detail is that for a long time in bread's history, way back when, white bread was considered the bread of the elite. If you were like, you know, part of the higher class, you ate white bread, while poor the poor ate dark bread and, uh, and whole grain bread. But those trends have reversed, huh? So in, in more recent history, whole grain bread is preferred as having a superior nutritional value and white bread, well, there's actually no nutritional value in white bread. So, and even in more recent times, bread has gotten a really bad rap because, you know, high carbs and gluten content. But thank God that today, carbs are once again considered good nutrition and tasty gluten-free bread is readily available. So, because in my book, there's, there's just nothing better than the smell of bread. Go ahead, one more time. You can, we're gonna smell it several times, so you just keep it in your hand. So, no matter how you slice it, the Bible has a lot to say about bread. And what I'd like to do uh, tonight is to, I want to make a fascinating connection between physical bread and hunger and spiritual bread and hunger that I believe is going to strengthen your faith at the very least. It's going to blow your mind. So let's not loaf around any longer. That's the last of the cheesy jokes. Somebody texted me and said, you forgot to say that you were on a roll. So... Wait, I just lost $50. I said, I bet if I tell you this, I'll bet you $50 that you can't resist saying that. So don't tell anyone I said this, okay? <laughs> the entire chapter of John chapter 6 is really all about Jesus making a connection between physical bread and hunger and spiritual bread and hunger. It begins with Jesus miraculously feeding 5,000 really hungry and I suspect very cranky People, And we're told in the opening verses of John chapter 6 that they have, they're following Jesus to the east shore of the Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, because he's been doing all these incredible miracles. And then in, in verse 3, it says that Jesus went up to a mountainside and he sat down with his disciples and the Jewish Passover festival was near. And when Jesus looked up and he saw a great crowd coming toward him, which ended up to being 5,000 people, he says to Philip, where shall we buy bread for all these people to eat? I mean, this is like, you know, an impossible task. But listen, it says that he asked this only to test Philip, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. So don't miss that. When Jesus asked this question, he already has in mind a lesson to teach his disciples something very deep and profound about faith. 
the actual faith lesson will, will not take place until this same crowd follows him to Capernaum the very next day. But please make sure that you don't miss this huge detail that the lesson Jesus has in mind is all about the connection between bread and hunger and faith. And he ends up feeding the entire crowd of 5,000 people, and he does it by miraculously multiplying one bread and fish lunch carried by a small boy in the crowd into a meal that feeds all 5,000 people and there are leftovers. I love that story. And to figure out the kind of test Jesus has in mind here, let's first look at the connection between bread and hunger and the Israelites, okay? Because all through this chapter, Jesus alludes back to the time when the Israelites wandered 40, for 40 years in the desert while God fed them manna from heaven each and every day. And the test he has in mind here is uh, connected to the same test that God gave to the Israelites as they wandered in the desert. Listen to this. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 and 3 says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart and whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger... And then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, and here's why, to teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So I don't know, have you ever thought about why we get hungry every day? Because surely God could have created us without this most basic daily need, but he didn't. Why? And one of the reasons why God created us to get hungry every day is because God wants us to make a connection between food and life, because without food, there's no life. And I think that you'll agree with me that at least most of us spend a fair amount of our time each day ensuring that we have enough food on our table to eat each day. Because we know that if we don't eat, it's not that we're just going to get hungry. We'll eventually die. You have to eat. And no one understood this more than the Jewish people of the Exodus who got delivered out of slavery from Egypt only to do 40 laps around the desert. And not just any old desert, this desert, the Sinai Desert right up here. That's what it looks like. Notice anything missing? Yeah, green food. There's no vegetation, just sand, hills, hundreds and hundreds of miles. And according to this passage, Deuteronomy, God brought the Israelites into this desert so they could learn the lesson that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, God wanted them and he wants us to learn that we're dependent on God for our daily needs because in reality, even something as basic as our daily bread really comes from God. We may think that we're getting it on our own, by our own effort, by our own work, by our own ingenuity, with our own bread, with our own money. But in reality, bread comes from God. And so the lesson here is that if bread is our life, then God is our life. Now, every Friday night at sunset, at the beginning of Shabbat, we Jews all around the world take a loaf of challah, just like Joel took earlier, and we recite the prayer, just like the one that he recited. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam humatzi lechem min ha'aretz. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth, who brings forth bread from the earth. And obviously this prayer is to remind us that ultimately it is God, not the baker, who is the one who gives us our daily bread. Because even the baker of daily bread is totally dependent on the grain that only God can bring forth from the earth. And so grab your piece of bread one more time. I'm going to take this one and just smell it. Oh, my gosh. How many of you haven't had dinner yet? Perfect. All right. Let's say the bread. Let's say let's say the prayer together. Okay, you can do the Hebrew and the English. You guys are good at this. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Ha'olam Humatzi Lechem Min Ha'aretz. 
Blessed are thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Okay? And so the point I want to make here is that when the Bible speaks about bread, it often makes the point that physically speaking, bread is our life because spiritually speaking, God is is our life. Without God, there's no bread. And that physical sensation that we all experience called hungry hunger, you know, when your stomach starts growling like it's begging, is really there because God wants us to have a constant reminder of our spiritual need for him. Someone once said, faith is just one beggar showing another beggar where to find food. I love that. I love that. And that's what we are. And, you know, there's nothing like fasting, like to underscore this reality. You know, fasting is not a mystical convocation that obligates God to do something for us. Fasting simply intensifies our physical hunger. And it's intended for us to hyper-focus on the reality that we are totally dependent upon God and God alone. And coming to a place of acknowledging our total and absolute dependence upon God and God alone, it's ground zero when it comes to faith. That's why Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord, have faith in the Lord, believe in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Why? Because that's going to lead you down a weird, crooked path, all right? But in all your ways, acknowledge God, and then he will make your paths straight. And so, is this making sense so far? All right. So, um, let's take a look at the connection between bread and hunger and the city of Bethlehem, my favorite part of this message. How many of you have ever read the book of Ruth in your Bible? Most of you have, but if you haven't, the book of Ruth is about a Jewish family who's forced to move out of Israel because of a severe famine that came to the land. They lived in the city of Bethlehem, which the Hebrew word, it's the Hebrew word that means house of bread. Beit means house, lechem means bread, and so Beit Lechem, which is how you pronounce Bethlehem in Hebrew, means house of bread. And if you recall from the story of Ruth, the house of bread runs out of bread. When a famine hits the land and Naomi and her family are forced to move 70 miles to the east across the Jordan River to the land of Moab. And while living there, Naomi's two Jewish sons marry Gentile wives. And it ends up being a tragic story because Naomi's husband and her two sons all die in Moab, leaving these three widows uh, on their own to take care of themselves. Back then, it was virtually, it was, it was extremely difficult for a, wo- a single woman to survive without the support of a man. But eventually, Naomi gets word that the famine in Bethlehem is over, so she and only one of her daughter-in-laws, Ruth, returns to Bethlehem just as the grain harvest is beginning. And what do you use grain to make? Bread. The house of bread is back in business. And these women show up so hungry and so desperate to find something to eat that Naomi sends Ruth into one of the local fields to pick up grain that is left behind for the poor as the Torah required. And after running into a compassionate man named Boaz, he loads Ruth up with so much grain that she and Naomi are able to make enough bread to feed an entire army. And here's where the story starts to get really interesting, okay? Boaz turns out to be related to Naomi. And he's what is called in the Torah as a goel, a kinsman redeemer, a family member responsible for acting on behalf of a relative who's in trouble. The kinsman redeemer is required in the Torah to redeem or to rescue a relative from whatever desperate situation they find themselves in. Boaz falls in love with Ruth, and they marry, and they have a son named Obed who fathers a child named Jesse. Jesse eventually fathers a son who will grow up to become King David. Now, why is this story, and particularly the city of Bethlehem, so important? Well, listen to this verse from Micah 5.2. It says, But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, 
Out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. This is a prophetic passage from the Hebrew Bible in the Tanakh, telling us about the promised Messiah of Israel who would originate from a small town called Beit Lechem. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. That's where we get that from. We get it from this verse in Micah. And what does Beit Lechem mean? House of bread. And so get this, of all the cities in Israel, or even the world, where God could have chosen for the Messiah to be born, he chose the one called the house of bread. A Messiah who, as the scriptures tell us, would be a descendant from the root of Jesse in the line of King David, born in a little town called Bethlehem. And so listen to this, let it soak in. Yeshua, the bread of life, was born in the house of bread. That, I think, is pretty darn cool. Don't you? But wait, there's more, okay? One of the reasons why many of the Jewish people in Jesus' day didn't accept him as the promised Messiah because he didn't seem to fit this prophecy in Micah. They knew that the scriptures in Micah told them clearly that the Messiah would originate from Bethlehem. But do you remember what Jesus is often called in Your Bibles, he is Jesus of Nazareth. Wait, Nazareth is in the north of Israel. Bethlehem is just south of Jerusalem. How can this be? And that's why in the very next chapter that we're looking at today, in chapter 7 of of the Gospel of John, verse 41, we find many Jews in the Bible questioning Jesus' Messiahship. Well, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? It it was and still is a fair question to ask, right? But God took care of this little detail. When he moved Caesar Augustus in the first century to take a population census in Israel. You see, when a population census was taken in the Roman Empire, every family had to return to its city of origin to register. Guess what? Joseph's city of origin was Bethlehem, the house of bread, because that's where everyone from David's family line originated from, and Joseph came from David's line. Luke chapter 2, verse 1, 4 through 5, tells us that in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth and Galilee to Judea, seems like He's from the north, it should be coming down. But you know, whenever you head towards Jerusalem, you always use the language of going up. You always make Aliyah, you go up to Jerusalem. Okay, so he's headed to the town of Nazareth, or he left Nazareth to Judea, all the way to Bethlehem, to the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. While they were there, as fate would have it, Mary, who is pregnant, goes into labor. And so Yeshua, the bread of life, who was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread, just as the scriptures promised, is fulfilled. Now, you know, I think that's awfully amazing, too. You should be like going, wow. You should be sitting in your seats going, this is too much, Gene. Hold back. (laughs) Just a historical coincidence. Or is it evidence that God blows on the events of history in such a way that they play out exactly the way he wrote this crazy story? I'll leave it for you to decide. But let's tie this all together by looking at the connection the Bible makes now between bread and hunger and faith. So let's remind ourselves of the context. Jesus has just fed 5,000 very hungry people who came out to hear him teach He multiplied a few loaves of bread and two fish into enough food that there were leftovers. He sends his disciples across the lake. In this story, we skip this section, is where Jesus comes out and walks on water, right? Such a show off. And then the people who this 5,000 is watching this, you know, from the shoreline, and they follow them all the way to Capernaum. And we pick up the story in John chapter 6, Uh, In verse 25, and it says this, 
When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? I like that. Like, you know, what a coincidence. Did we happen to bump into each other? Okay. I mean, Jesus knew they were following him for a reason. He's going to address it right here. He says, very tr truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw these miraculous signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and your bellies were full and you like having your bellies filled. And then he says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked, well, what must we do to do the works that God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, well, what kind of a sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that came down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And then in verse 48, he again says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live together. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So worship team can come up as I finish here. I want to focus, I want to dial in. I want to kind of double click on verse 27. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. Because once again, Jesus definitely has in view here the Exodus story. And if you recall from the Exodus story about Passover, that when God brought the Jews out of Egypt into Sinai Desert, there were about two to three million men, women, and children to feed every day. Can you imagine how much food it takes to feed two to three million people every day? Especially in a place where there's virtually no food anywhere in sight. And that's why when the people get there, if, you, if you've read this story before, you know that when they get there, they start to grumble at Moses. Why did you bring us here? To die? To starve to death? We want to go back to Egypt. Because at least in Egypt, our bellies were full. Now, can you believe that? I mean, think about this. They, they, wanted to go back into slavery just so that they could experience the temporary satisfaction of having their bellies full. And think about this in your own life. What kind of slavery are you willing to endure in order to experience temporary satisfaction? Drugs? Alcohol? Sex? Food, work, shopping, I mean, we can make a long list of things. Now, remember from this passage that we looked at earlier that God brought them into the desert to teach them a lesson. That they can't live on bread alone, but by every word, every promise that, God, that comes from God's mouth. In other words, whatever God does to solve their hunger problem in the desert is designed to teach them something about faith and to solve this incredible challenge of feeding two to three million people. God rained down this bread-like sub substance called manna every day for 40 years, except of course on the Sabbath. Because the day before the Sabbath, he let them gather a double portion and it stayed fresh through the Sabbath. Because why? You can't work on Shabbat. But there was a catch about gathering the manna. God told the Israelites that they could collect as much manna as they could eat. It was an all-you-can-eat fest, right? Right? 
But any extra manna that they kept, that they didn't eat and tried to keep it overnight would spoil and get maggots and stink like high heaven the next day. In Exodus chapter 16, we read about it. It says, Moses says to them, no one is to keep any of it until the morning. However, some paid no attention to Moses and they kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and it began to smell. And this seems really crazy because even though God made this point really clear to them, and even though every time they went out and collected more than they can eat and tried to store it, it got maggots and it began to stink, there were still some who went out each and every day and collected food that was only going to rot overnight. Can you picture that in your mind, the craziness? People going out each and every day, toiling in the hot sun for, for things that are just going to spoil, they're just going to rot. Does that make any sense to anybody in this room? And yet, isn't that what a lot of us do each and every day of our lives? We get up in the morning, we go out the door, we work, and not for everything that's going to rot, but for a lot of the things that we collect in this life, they're just going to rot. You cannot take it with you. Now, I have said this, I don't know, maybe a dozen times in my 23 years here. Here is the lesson of the manna. Get this, okay? This is so foundational to faith. All the manna the Israelites collected each day that was more than they needed just for their daily bread that they tried to store to keep to the next day is called unbelief. It's a lack of faith. Why? Because they did not trust that God, that even though God came th through for them day after day after day, they just did not ever trust that he would come through for them the next day. All the manna the Israelites collected each day that was just enough food for their daily bread is called faith, trust, belief. Because they trusted that God would come through for them the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, just like he did for 40 years. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. And so the people say to Jesus, work, ha, work, we get work. We've been slaves for 400 years. Put us to work. What kind of work do we have to do? Dig a pit? I mean, come on, jump through hoops. We'll do it. And Jesus says, this is the work God requires, to believe in the one that he has sent. It seems easy, but so many would rather dig a pit, jump through a hoop. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger and never thirst again. So let's stand up. Come on. Smell your bread one more time. Getting so close to that moment. As a way to kind of close out this part of the evening, let's say a prayer together. It'll be up here on the on the screen. And if you're able to make this the prayer of your heart, let's read it together. God, I want to trust you for each day. 
Help me stop fearing tomorrow. Set me free from being a slave to temporary satisfaction. Help me stop fearing tomorrow. I no longer desire to work for things that will only rot. Help me to stop fearing tomorrow. I want to live by faith and not by sight. Help me to stop fearing tomorrow. This bread I'm about to eat is my life because you are my life. Help me to stop fearing tomorrow.